Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. The subject of today's show, the National Farmers Organization's National Convention in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm delighted to welcome to our show once again the newly re-elected president of NFO, Mr. Orrin Lee Staley. Thank you, Bill. Orrin Lee, I want to congratulate you on your election. It was a, a fine victory, and uh, I know that uh, there was some opposition, but that's all in the democratic uh, process, and I think it worked out very well. Well, Bill, I think it's important that we're only elected for one year in the NFO, and this gives the members and the delegates an opportunity to change leaders if they want to at the end of one year. That way uh, we have to keep on our toes and do the best job possible. Of course, uh, we look up in, on the offices that we hold as a part of a cause. And any time that they can find someone else that can do a better job, uh, we want them to elect them. We tell them that frankly. It takes a lot of teamwork uh, and leadership uh, to get a job done such as we're doing. What year is this for you? How many well, terms does this really, make? Really, Bill, uh, there are about uh, three eras or, of the NFO. Uh -huh. There was a protest era. era. Then, uh, then uh, we uh, went through a transition period. And really, we've been in collective bargaining about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what we're really talking about now in the organization is uh, the 10 years of collective bargaining, because that's when it moved into really a fundamentally sound organization. Orrin Lee, as you know, our U.S. Farm Report camera crews covered the convention in all of its various <laughs> facets. And um, among uh, many of the interviews that uh, we made there, uh, we talked with uh, some future farmers of America, mm -hmm. a group of young fellows who uh, had come to convention, had been sent to convention, and I think their expenses had been paid, actually, by uh, their uh, organizations, hadn't they? I'm not familiar, but I think they were, Bill, on that. And uh, they came there to see uh, rural America in democratic action, and that's exactly what uh, the NFO convention was. At this time, let's take a minute and uh, watch these young fellows and listen to what they have to say, okay? Be fine. Ladies and gentlemen, we are speaking to you from the corridor just outside of the main convention hall here at Freedom Hall at the National Convention of NFO in Louisville, Kentucky. As you can see, there are in attendance at this year's convention a number of young members of the Future Farmers of America. A very familiar sight, the now traditional purple jacket worn by these young men. These uh, young men, some of them, were sent here to this convention at the invitation of NFO. Their trips were sponsored by the county NFO chapters. Others came uh, on their own, of their own volition. It is only right and proper that the NFO convention should be attended by these young people because indeed the future of agriculture in America lies in the hands and minds of young fellows like these. Hi. How are you? How are you? Pretty good. The back of your jacket says Wisconsin. What, uh, right. what uh, town in Wisconsin Schilling. do you live near? Schilling. What part of the state is this in? This is the northwestern uh, part, Horseman County. I see. And your name? Kirk Glesson. Kirk, how big a farm do you come from? Well, we got a pretty small farm now. We auctioned off and uh, yeah, had a all 200 acre farm. Now we went down a smaller one and uh, we raised about everything. A little of just about everything. I see. How big a family do you come from? I, we're seven in the family. Seven? Yeah. Four Are boys you, uh, and one girl. Have you been in the dairy business? We always think of uh, dairy yes. when we think of Wisconsin. Uh, we still are, but small. <clears throat> Are you enjoying the uh, NFO convention? Yes, I am. It's well, real good. Fine. What I do you enjoy. feel uh, is uh, where the real future in farming? Where, where, where does the future lie? I think it's got the line corporation maybe not but at least larger farmers mm -hmm. as, as they talk the smaller farms are going to keep going but the smaller farms are owned by older people and you don't see many young farmers anymore do you think that uh in your case for example that uh your generation and perhaps your children might uh keep your family farm going or do you foresee a, a change in that i think i see a change already i can't actually say I'll be farming myself. I'll be in agriculture, but there's 
different fields. There's not only farming. At least you could help in agriculture in some way. Why do you feel you won't farm? Well, we don't have a big enough farm to start, and if you don't have a father now that you can go on with, it's awful hard. It's quite an investment. You'll never see the end of it if you don't. Okay, thank you very much. Excuse me, I want to get over and say hi to Jim Buck. Jim, how are you? Just fine. Now, let's see. Uh, state president this year? State vice president. Vice president in right. Illinois. That's right. And what's the part of Illinois do you come from, Jim? From the East Central part, from the Armstrong chapter. Now, I've had a little uh, advance on you. Uh, your uh, father is a member of NFO, is he not? That's right. And uh, what kind of farming do you do in Illinois? Well, we are, uh, our farm is a grain farm primarily, but the dad and I are in partnership with his dad and two brothers. And uh, in the four families, there's two swine herds, two beef herds, and then 1,200 acres of grain land. Well, yours is indeed uh, an excellent example of the American family farm. You actually right. have three generations going on that farm right now. Right. <clears throat> you heard this young man uh, say that he uh, wondered about the future in agriculture of the family farm. How do you feel about it? Well, I wonder about it, too. And uh, I am going to look very, very hard at the situation before I say that I'm going to farm. And I do know this, I do know this definitely, that if the situation hasn't changed by the time I am ready to farm, I'm not going to. Well, now, the situation, I'm, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I'm interpreting that what you mean by the situation is the lack of ability to make a living. I'm talking about, well, this is just one way of saying it, but I'm talking about when the farmer buys anything, there's a price tag on it. When he sells it, he has very, very little voice in it. And I'm not a lazy person, but I'm not going to work in a situation where I have all the risks of weather, insect, disease, and then when it finally comes to where I do uh, raise a quality product and then get shot down at the marketplace. Well, as we often say, in agriculture, the price is the name of the game. That's right. And uh, I, I know that the FFA creed uh, has something to say about that. Would you repeat it for me? Oh, there's many parts of the creed that you could be talking about, but I think the part that you're talking about is the very beginning of the fourth paragraph. And it goes, uh, I believe, in less dependence on begging and more power in bargaining. There you are. Well, I think that uh, this certainly uh, fits hand in glove with the NFO philosophy. Wouldn't you agree to that? From what I have learned about the National Farmers Organization, it certainly does. Jim, it's a pleasure to see you today. Are you enjoying the convention? I sure am. This is really democracy in action here, isn't it? It's a little bit different kind of a convention I think you'll ever find anyplace else. I think so, else. too. Lots of good luck to you. Okay, thank you. How are you? Oh, okay. What is your name? Joe Beaver. Joe, where are you from? Northwestern Wisconsin. Now, uh, you are... No, or were president last no, year. my brother was. Oh, this is your brother? Yes. I see. Okay. Joe, uh, how big a farm do you live on? A 320-acre dairy farm. And what about your family? How, uh, how many children? There's seven children. What, what, about, uh, what about the dairy business? How do you feel about it economically? Well, I think it's an awful tight business because your investment is so large and you have so little income. So the only way that most keep going is use up their capital and their investment. And the trouble with the dairy business, too, that you have to be there every day of the year, morning and night, and work from about 5.30 in the morning till 10 at night. And this is why their average age is like 60. Up in the dairy country of Wisconsin, Joe, where you come from, uh, is this problem prevalent, that of having farmers who are getting pretty old and young people, the younger generation, not staying on the farms? I think this is a very great problem because we have many farmers that are as much as 20 years over retirement age still farming, and I can only think of maybe three or four under 30 that have gone in in the last few years. What's it going to take, Joe, to keep you uh, on the family farm and to keep you in agriculture? Well, I think that the profit is going to have to be increased and that there won't be such a wide gap in what you pay and what you get. In other words, 
You're talking about the farmer getting a fair price for his product. Yes. Okay, Joe. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? Fine. This is Joe Broadman. Where are you from, Joe? Cary, Ohio. Ohio. Hi. And what about your farm? What kind of a farm do you come from? Now we come from a 125-acre owned farm, and we rent some, yeah, plus that, which equals about 350. Now, how big a family do you have? We have nine children. You're from a big family. Right. Well, now, this is a family farm. Uh, the family farms, of course, as you know, across the country are certainly threatened, and there is uh, quite an exodus from the farm these days. In fact, national figures tell us that 2,500 farmers every week are going out of business on the farms. Right. Uh, do you feel like you're going to stay on the farm, Joe? Uh, if prices on farm commodities don't increase, I doubt probably whether I will. But if they start increasing, I probably will, because I like farming. Well, it's going to take, then, uh, a good price, or at least a fair price, right. for the effort expended and the investment that you have. Now, I'm sure that uh, on 125 acres, people don't realize this, but you have, <clears throat> along with your father and your family, quite a dollar investment, don't you? Right. And yet the return is somewhat questionable always. What do you think of NFO? Have you given any thought to it? Yeah, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good organization which helps the farmer gain higher prices. The way it's going now, it looks like we might get higher prices if nothing drastic happens. All right. Thank you, Joe. It's very nice to see you. Are you enjoying the convention? I sure am. Good. Hope to see you again soon. Yeah, Lots of good you. luck to you. Warren Lee, I think we have just seen right there, indeed, the future of agriculture and, for that matter, the future of NFO. When you look into your crystal ball, looking into the future as president of NFO, what do you foresee for these young people? Well, Bill, I think that it's very obvious to any thinking man or lady either because they make up agriculture too. Mm -hmm. It's a family operation as of now. The first thing I think that we all can agree on is that the average age of farmers at 57 years of age uh, means that our type of agriculture is deteriorating and it's going to be worse than deteriorating. It's going to leave the scene as a family type farming setup. Unless there's enough profit in agriculture so that young farmers like these uh, can stay in agriculture and have the desire to stay in agriculture. Now this is really what the NFO is all about. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's all about this uh, a subject and heart of it, I have a son of my own that now in college that wants to return to the farm. He gives a typical statement. I want to return to the farm. If it's profitable, I'll stay. If it isn't, I'll use my education in some other field. And this is too bad, really, uh, because right. we're losing this good talent. Right. And what is NFO doing about well, it? Well, of course, there's only one key to this bill, and that is to get a fair price. Now, I think that uh, what we have to realize is that progressive, business-thinking farmers uh, know that they're living in a different economy today than they lived in even one year ago. Mm -hmm. Certainly much different than five years ago, or, and it's so much different, almost unbelievable, uh, in comparison with 20 years ago. So really what we're talking about is this, that today when I buy some repairs for my tractor, the prices are up. Uh, tremendously up from a year ago and unbelievably more than five years ago. And when we track back the reason, and I'm just using one example that's typical of all examples that I could use, but well, we'll buy repairs on a tractor. What happens with these prices up? It simply means that if you trace the reason for these prices being up, you'll find there was an economic power block somewhere. We'll say first organized labor. They uh, negotiated a better contract with the uh, benefits that they uh, not had before, fringe benefits. So what does this mean? It means that uh, we as a farmer uh, pay for those uh, increased wages. But uh, let's look at it from the business standpoint. The steel industry uh, raised the prices also to raise their profit level because if they don't raise their profit level, it means that those that do not uh, uh, buy or those that do buy stock and companies are only going to buy in companies that are making a profit that's comparable uh, <coughs> to the other companies in other segments of the economy or there's no use buying the, the stock of this company that would be unprofitable. Yeah. So it means that it's not by accident that Bethlehem Steel, for example, raises the price of steel and everybody else follows suit. It's uh, really an industry decision. Uh, that they have to raise the profits to be comparable to other segments of the economy. So what happens? 
The farmer that buys this repair for his tractor uh, pays uh, the increased wages uh, for them. He pays for the increased profits in industry. And then we're getting down to what we're talking about. And that is that individuals cannot compete in today's economy because these power blocks are the reason that he's having to pay mm -hmm. a higher price uh, for everything he buys. So it means that what we're talking about is that the farmers build an economic block so that they can compete with that economic block and so that they can pass their prices uh, uh, on to the marketplace that will justify them a fair price for their products. And so then it becomes inconsequential of whether or not uh, the uh, cost of labor goes up or the cost of interest goes up or the cost of the tractor goes up because then they can pass their increased cost on at the marketplace. And that's what NFO is all about. And by these actions, we can keep this young talent on the farm. Bill, the youth that is in agriculture and those that want to be a part of agriculture as farmers, I believe are progressive thinking people. They realize what's happening in the rest of the economy. And so they should, and we hope they do, and we encourage them to do so immediately, to join the NFO. Because there's no great secret in bargaining. There's no great secret in how you meet the agricultural problems of today. You have to get a price that's fair in relationship to the rest of the commodity prices in this nation. For farmers, this means they have to be able to compete in today's economy. And so in order to do this, they have to join the NFO. This makes it possible for them to build their economic strength, to build their economic strength with their fellow farmers so that the block of production can be built to the point that only the buyers can find their needs by buying from this block. There's no great secret to it. And then farmers can put their price tag on their products in the same manner that the steel industry, as I spoke of, or as the working people do on their work. And so this is what we're really talking about, two steps, join the NFO, and block their production together so they, where they move their production in a block so that not a pound of milk or a head of livestock or a bushel of grain moves unless it moves through the block of production. And this way they can put a price tag on their products. So we need the young farmers for their leadership, for their progressive thinking, and for the use of their production together as farmers so that we can put a price tag on our products. And this is a way that the youth can stay in agriculture because it will be profitable, but it will be profitable only if they take these steps. Warren Lee, as you know, at National Convention in Louisville, U.S. Farm Report had the pleasure of interviewing two Canadian visitors to the convention. Mm. Now, these two young fellows uh, were very enthusiastic members yeah. of the National Farmers <coughs> Union of Canada. Yeah. Uh, right now, let's take a look at this interview, and then I'd like for you to comment on uh, on this. Fine, Bill. Naturally, fellas, I want to discuss with both of you your Canadian National Farmers Union in some detail. But before we get into it, uh, perhaps we should qualify you, Peter, uh, by saying that you are junior president of, NY of NFU, and I'd like for you to tell me just exactly what junior president is? Um, actually, Bill, the role of junior president is to try and get more juniors involved into the organization. And uh, as such, as well, I'm in charge of, of other programs uh, such as uh, queen competition within the organization, such as talent contests. But I would have to stress that the overall role is to try and get our young rural people and young farmers interested in the National Farmers Un Union, and as a result, to have them participate and thereby, you know, build an organization whereby the future yes. uh, will, we can, we can keep the future people and have them interested into the organization. Well, it seems very obvious, Jerry, that uh, Canada is sharing some of the same problems in agriculture that uh, we have in this country, one of them being keeping the young people on the farms. Yes, Bill, I believe that's a, a very accurate statement. Uh, I'd like to first of all uh, tell you that uh, I had the privilege of attending this convention and one prior to this. 
and hearing the, the uh, speakers and talking to the farmers here, uh, the situation isn't such that uh, the young people don't like the working conditions on the farm. It's purely an economic one, and uh, this is exactly the same one that we have in Canada. It's purely economics. Peter and Jerry, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the National Farmers Union of Canada. Uh, tell me something of its philosophies and beliefs and concepts and what this organization is trying to accomplish for the Canadian farmer. Uh, Bill, I'll try and do this in as few words as possible. Uh, up until this summer, we had no real national farmers organization in Canada. We had provincially autonomous unions, and we have come to the conclusion over the last few years that even though we have tried to do a job, we couldn't keep up with the times, we just weren't moving fast enough, and having had considerable contact with the NFO, we discovered that our only solution was to form a strong national organizations, uh, organization quite comparable with the NFO. And we had a study done by a company specializing in this line, and they presented to us a proposal, you might say, of a new organization, uh, which we are working on at the present time. And this proposal is based, again, along the lines of, of the NFO, with collective bargaining or the farmer actually putting a price on his own product being the main goal and the main motto. Now, we had a founding convention uh, at uh, Winnipeg, which is uh, central Canada, uh, June, or sorry, July 30th and 31st this past summer. At that time, most of our provinces uh, relinquished their provincial autonomies and joined up with the National Farmers Union, the new National Farmers Union. Since then, several more have come in, and this week, there's another province having their, what you might say, their annual convention on a provincial basis, and my hopes are that they as well will come into the National Farmers Union. Uh, out our way, we have a real problem, which I believe you have in the U.S. as well, and this is a condition of autonomous groups. And I don't have to say anything about uh, wrong or bad about any autonomous groups, but we all feel, or they all feel, that they're best, and they hate to give up anything. Uh, therefore, we're having some problems to make other people, other farmers, other organizations believe that a national organization will be their answer. But I can say that uh, with the, uh, our experiences in the past, I'm quite confident and hopeful that we will have a strong National Farmers Union where actually every province or farmers within every province will participate even before this year is up. That's marvelous. That's just outstanding. Peter, so many people who really don't know about the farm economy seem to feel that the farmer's plight is the farmer's plight, that it affects only him and nobody else. Now, in this country, that is far from the truth, and I presume in Canada you could say the same thing. Oh, I would say, Bill, this is completely untrue. It affects the economy as a whole, and especially, initially, the rural economy. Just recently, I, I, I made a speaking tour throughout Canada, and it is so obvious in the rural areas that if where the farmers are the hardest up, that's where the rural towns are decayed the yes. worst as well. And uh, it is certainly my hope that we are able to up our own income because if we're able to do this I think we can do a, a not only a service to the rural community but to the country as a whole yes gentlemen it's been a real pleasure having both of you Jerry Peter always a pleasure to say hello to our friends north of the border and in closing may I extend the hand of NFO in America to the hands of NFU in Canada Hopefully that one day, as you have suggested, Jerry, these hands will be joined into perhaps what will be called an international organization under NFO or NFU. Thank you, Bob. It's been my pleasure. Well, Oren Lee, I think that uh, NFO should be flattered by the fact that uh, our Canadian neighbors have patterned their organization after uh, your organization in this country. This is right, Bill, yes. Now, uh, these fellows talked about a parallel of, of agricultural problems between the United States and Canada. 
I think I've heard you mention that really uh, the agricultural problems that exist here exist the world over. This is correct, Bill, and we foresee the time. In fact, we've had many visits from agricultural representatives of all the common market countries of Europe. And we foresee the time that there will be uh, an agricultural unity type program and probably cooperation where legally possible worldwide. Uh, that there has to be a period of time that uh, we go through an adjustment. But nevertheless, eventually, we're going to have to have worldwide agreements uh, where that uh, floor prices are determined. Uh, there's a pool set up uh, to take care of excess production from all the countries that go into the underdeveloped countries but that these uh, products that we produce as uh, farmers in all uh, countries throughout the world, that they're not used uh, as a dumping price uh, situation type market mm -hmm. uh, worldwide, and that's what the world market price is now, and so the countries that do produce are going to have to put a price tag on their products in order to keep agriculture in the hands of the farmers that own the agricultural production and that have the individual initiative and the desire to really produce food. That's the only type of agriculture that's ever worked anywhere in the world. Orrin Lee, I want to thank you for being a guest on U.S. Farm Report and giving us this uh, excellent look into the future of agriculture and NFO. Well, Bill, it's in relative terms, it just means that farmers have the opportunity to use the NFO as their tool to get a fair price for their products at the marketplace. They cannot do it as individuals, but by joining the NFO, blocking their production together, they can and will put a price tag on their products. And the reason we have already raised the farm prices with unexpected farm price increases on many commodities is because of the success and the use of the strength of the NFO at this point. Our guest today on U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Oren Lee Staley, National President of the NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.